Hi, welcome to the Iowa State Geometric Analysis Center. Today's speaker is Yuri Ustinovsky, who's a C.C. Schwung Visiting Assistant Professor at Lehigh University. Before this, he was a Kronz instructor at the Kronz Institute. Today, we'll be talking about geometric flows and complex manifolds and generalized Kaleritsi solids. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's really uh, a pleasure to, to talk here. Yeah, I'll be talking to, today about geometric flows on mostly non kellar manifolds based on joint works with Jeffrey Streets and Vesislav Apostolov. So let me start with a basic introduction, so which goes all the way back to uniformization of Riemannian surfaces. So if you have uh, a closed surface with a complex structure, which I denote by I, so I squares to negative identity, then uh, the set of such uh, complex structures are in one-to-one -one correspondence with a set of conformal classes of metrics plus a choice of orientation. Or choice of orientation we have to specify because uh, for a given conformal class, if you have a complex structure I, negative I is also a complex structure. So, which gives us the following natural question. Uh, if we are given a conformal class of metrics, can we choose uh, some distinguished representative? And the uh, uniformiza uniformization theorem tells us that yes, uh, we actually can uh, find uh, a unique up to a, a constant uh, smooth function u such that if you conformally change your metric multiplied by e to the power u, then this new metric will have constant Gaussian curvature. And the curvature, uh, its, uh, its value is purely, its sign is purely topological. It's the same as the sign of uh, earlier characteristic. So there are many proofs of this theorem, of course, by now it's, it all goes all the, all the way back to 19th century. Uh, and I would like actually mention the one which is probably the most recent proof. So this proof uh, rests on the notion of a Ricci flow or normalized Ricci flow. Uh, so you can actually set up uh, a one parameter family of metrics uh, by specifying the initial metric G naught and specifying the evolution equation which is given by this quantity which I, I have here. So actually, let me by this quantity. So it's negative Gaussian curvature plus for normalization we add actually a multiple of metric itself. Uh, so this for property chosen uh, constant lambda, this flow exists uh, for all times, for all positive times and converges smoothly to a metric at infinity uh, with the property that this metric at infinity has constant uh, Gaussian curvature lambda. So most of the uh, necessary ingredients for the proof of the theorem were set up by Hamilton and Joe, and essentially like the little final bit regarding the existence of, of the skeletons or the behavior of the flow on the spheres uh, was, uh, was done by Chen, Lu, and Tian in, in the late 2000s. So basically what this uh, theorem shows you that you can start with arbitrary metric and you basically don't know have, don't, don't have a priori knowledge about uh, your manifold, but the flow guides you to what the canonical metric is and uh, it proves the existence of this canonical metric for you. So this flow on a general Riemannian manifold uh, was introduced by Hamilton and it is called Ricci flow. So the way it's formulated on a general Riemannian manifold is that we flow our metric uh, by negative uh, Ricci uh, curvature of a metric. And two here is inessential, it's just for normalization uh, conventions, uh, but negative is important. So negative is what makes this equation uh, weakly parabolic and guarantees that it has a solution for positive time. So what Hamilton proves that you can solve always for at least some short time uh, forward uh, this equation, but the issue is that this flow might develop uh, singularity and actually it happens uh, in many examples which we know and flow fails to exist on larger time interval. That's uh, that's in practice what we what we face with this when we study this flow. So 
basically there are two ideal scenarios if you would like to apply this flow. Uh, one ideal scenario is that appropriately normalized flow exists on uh, uh, on the entire positive uh, timeline and converges to an Einstein metric. Right? Einstein metrics uh, are precisely those which are scale stationary on this flow. So if g is proportional to g itself, then g just shrinks or expands depending on the sign of lambda. So that's one ideal scenario. Another ideal scenario that uh, while it fails to exist uh, on the entire timeline, we can understand well enough how exactly it develops singularity. And normally the development of the singularities informs us about geometry topology of manifold. And that's really the heart of the Perelman solution to geometrization conjecture. So now something special and interesting happens if your manifold is actually Keller. So I recall that manifold is Keller if it has uh, a metric G and the compatible complex structure I, such that the underlying fundamental form, so if you hook in I into G, you'll get uh, uh, two forms. So these two forms is closed. Um, that's the definition of a Keller manifold. So this two form are closed, and we also have a topological assumption, topological assumption that first term class is uh, zero, uh, in the rank homology for on the Keller manifold, then we are actually in this first scenario. And that's uh, the result which was proved by Tsao in 85. So the precise statement is follows. So if you start with a compact Keller manifold uh, for which C1 is zero, so the first term class is zero, then Ricci flow uh, starting at this metric First, it preserves Keller condition that actually was observed by Hamilton already. So if you start with a Keller metric and you flow it by Ricci flow, it will remain Keller. Uh, but what is more important, the, the flow actually exists for, for the entire timeline up to plus infinity and converges to a smooth metric. And this first smooth metric is characterized by the uh, condition that Ricci curvature of this final, uh, final uh, limit metric is uh, zero. So these are important metrics from the physics point of view. These are called Calabi-Yau metrics. And actually what we see here is another proof of uh, uh, Calabi's conjecture, which was initially proved by Yao in uh, 1978. So his proof, Yao's proof was uh, through uh, elliptic equations, uh, elliptic uh, nonlinear PDEs, uh, this solution by Tsao is essentially through corresponding parabolic PDE. And in some sense, uh, it's easier. So many estimates uh, which Yao uh, did initially, they actually are simpler and easier in this group. So that shows you a power of this geometric flows method. So you can prove existence of some special metrics by just choosing appropriate flow and applying it to essentially arbitrary initial condition. So what I want to discuss next is a uh, specific uh, geometry of complex surfaces. So from now on, we assume that our manifold is real four dimensional or complex two dimensional, that's why it's called surface. And I is a complex structure. And there is a big open problem uh, in, in the field of complex geometry, specifically classification of complex surfaces. So there exists so-called Enrique's Cadera classification, but it's actually not a complete description of all complex, complex surfaces. And there is a specific class, which is by historical reasons now called Cadera's class seven, for which uh, we don't really understand well how they look like. So there are several conjectures uh, of, and some of them, for instance, the so-called spherical shell conjecture actually would provide complete classification of such surfaces. So we, we have a believable uh, as hypothesis, believable conjecture how the, all the surfaces look like, but we still are very far from being able to prove it. And the possible approach which uh, we might take is try to develop an appropriate geometric flow for this, for this setting. So we start with a complex surface, we pick a Hermitian metric, uh, we run some geometric flow, 
and try to understand its uh, long time existence, behavior, understand whether it develops singularity and how it develops singularity. And again, ideally, in the end of the day, being able to classify, to finish classification of complex surfaces. So it will not only give you classification, it also will provide you with some distinguished geometries for complex surfaces as Thurston's geometrization provides you with geometries for three-dimensional manifolds. So that's kind of a dream. That's what we uh, really would like uh, to see happening with this application of geometric flows. So again, we have this surface. Uh, the problem is that uh, there are many surfaces for which you cannot find a Keller metric. So the, you, there are non-Keller uh, surfaces which do not admit any Keller metrics. So we cannot really run keller ricci flow on those. We cannot run Ricci flow either because Ricci flow, uh, unfortunately, doesn't preserve your mission condition if your initial metric is not Keller. So Ricci flow, or it's like what is, what would be called Keller Ricci flow if we are on a Keller background, does not apply to uh, some of the surfaces. So we we'll have to do something else. Uh, and maybe the first natural question to ask here, are there any distinguished metrics uh, on a given surface? And there is a, a very important and powerful theorem due to Godishon. So I will formulate it on complex surfaces, but actually it has its analog on any Hermitian manifold. So what it says is that if you take any Hermitian metric on a complex manifold, uh, then in its conformal class, you can find unique uh, up to scaling uh, representative uh, for which uh, fundamental one one form, which I usually call omega, well, it will not be closed as it is on a uh, Keller manifold, but it will be pluriclosed. So DDC of omega equals zero. So recall that Omega is a two form which you obtain if you substitute I in society of metric. And DC is so called twisted differential. So you multiply your uh, differential form by I, you apply I coordinate uh, component wise, you apply differential, and then you apply I to the result. So this is so called twisted differential. So this theorem due to Gaudishon tells you that, well, you, while you cannot always find Keller metric, there are some nice metrics on uh, complex surfaces and there is a unique nice metric in every conformal class. So such metrics satisfying this condition, they are called pluriclosed metrics or sometimes uh, in physics, mostly in physics paper, they're called strong Keller distortion. Uh, I really hate this name because when you hear strong Keller, you think it's stronger than Keller, but actually this thing is weaker than Keller, they are non-Keller, right? Because D omega is, uh, is non-zero in general. So this tensor, which appears here, H, so DC of omega, it's a three form, and this three form is what is called uh, torsion. So this torsion vanishes on the Keller background, but it's non-zero non in general. So what we would like to see is to have some sort of flow which uh, preserves this pluriclosed condition. Since any surface has a pluriclosed metric due to the result of Gaudichon, it makes sense to try to look for flows which preserve this pluriclosed condition. So such uh, flow was identified. So again, you start with a complex surface with a pluriclosed metric. Uh, I will need one uh, bit of notation. So this bit of notation is a special one form, which is called Lee form, which can be defined on any Hermitian manifold and is characterized by this identity. So there is a distinguished one form, which in, in dimension of our interest, specifically in complex dimension uh, two, is just Hodge dual of torsion three form. So what Stritz and Tian discovered in uh, uh, 09 is that uh, if you consider Hermitian manifold with initial pluriclosed metric and you consider a flow given by this equation, then first it admits a unique short time uh, solution. And second, it preserves both Hermitian and pluriclosed conditions. 
So if you flow your metric according to this evolution equation, then the new metric will be still Hermitian and it will be still pluriclosed. So that's why they call it pluriclosed flow. So maybe I'll comment a bit on this equation. So if you look at it carefully, and if you imagine that you're on a Keller background, so in the Keller background, H vanishes, so this term disappears. And Lee form also vanishes because Lee form is just Hodge dual of H. So this term also disappears. And uh, you, go, you go back to the usual Ricci flow. But in general, it's something else. It's not the Ricci flow. So maybe I should mention that uh, Street and Tian, they were not first who came up with the evolution equation uh, of this sort. It appears appeared in physics uh, as something called renormalization group flow, uh, which I don't have a good understanding of. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested, here's a reference. Uh, you can look up the paper. And uh, it also recovers something called generalized Ricci flow. Uh, and this generalized Ricci flow, it appears in the context of so-called generalized geometry. So this is approach to geometry initiated by Hitchin uh, and then developed by Gualtieri in Keller setting and then first developed by Streets and Garcia Fernandez. So that's not a random evolution equation. It looks a bit random and all these coefficients, they uh, seem arbitrary, but they are actually not. So all these uh, signs and quantities, they, they are specifically tailored for this flow to work. So if you want to study any geometric flow, your zero step should be to understand stationary points. So you need to understand which structures are fixed. So for instance, for Ricci flow, if you imagine that there are, there are no distortion terms. So for Ricci flow, the stationary points are Ricci flat manifolds. And the Ricci flat manifolds uh, are of course well studied in the French geometry. It's one of the uh, most extensively studied topics in differential geometry uh, probably. So uh, Ricci flat manifolds is, uh, is something we all know and like. So what will be the analog of this Ricci flat condition if you add this extra term? Maybe let's give a couple examples of such structures. So, well, obviously, if you take a uh, uh, Keller surface with Keller Ricci flat metric, so that is something called Calabi Yau surface. So if you have a Keller Ricci flat metric on a complex surface, uh, it will clearly be stationary under this flow. And we actually know all such surfaces. Such surfaces are classified, and these are either flat tori or K3 surfaces. So all K3 surfaces, they have moduli as well as flat tori. So as complex surfaces, these are actually families. But as differentiable manifolds, there are two examples. Well, I should probably say that or finite quotients of those. There are also finite quotients of those. So that's, uh, that's sort of boring example because that's where there is no torsion. And we are sort of interested in the cases where there is torsion and where we have something non-Keller. And there is a nice non-Keller example. It is standard Hopf surface. So maybe let me recall you the definition. So we could take C2, uh, a fine space. We can remove a point, so origin. And on this uh, space, C2 is removed point. We can define the contraction. We define a contraction where we multiply both coordinates uh, by complex numbers alpha and beta. And in this case, we assume that these complex numbers alpha and beta, they have the same norm, which is less than one. So this is this uh, specific uh, class of contractions of C2 minus the origin. So you can quotient by this contraction and what you'll obtain is differentiable manifold. It will be just three-dimensional sphere multiplied by uh, a circle. As, as a smooth manifold. And it inherits complex structure from, uh, from the covering space. And with this complex structure, it's called hop surface. It clearly is never Keller because this manifold doesn't have a uh, second homology, so it cannot uh, admit a symplectic structure, while any Keller manifold is a symplectic manifold. And it has a very nice distinguished metric. Uh, specifically, you could take usual Euclidean metric on C2 and uh, conformally normalize it by the norm of Z. So this is actually a cylinder metric on the product S3 cross R. 
which is diffeomorphic to C2 minus the origin. And it descends to the hop surface. And this metric uh, one can check is pluri closed and stationary for this flow. So uh, flow actually fixes this metric. So it's natural to ask, are there any other examples in the theorem of Gaudish Khan of Ivanov of 97, uh, which you can see actually appeared before any flow discussion discussions even started. So this is before the pluri closed flow was, was found. Uh, so this uh, theorem basically gives you complete classification of uh, structures which are stationary under the pluri closed flow. Specifically, specifically, it tells you that either your torsion is zero, which means that you're a Keller, and in this case, your, uh, your surface is Calabi-Yau surface, which is again, either Tori or K3 surface of the finite quotient, or it's a finite quotient of this Hobbes surface, which I just mentioned. So finite cover of your manifold M is isometric to top surface with a, a product metric, which are a cylindrical product metric, which I have just discussed. So it's a round metric on S3 and a constant metric on, on S1, again, appropriately scaled. Okay. So basically these examples, which we saw on the previous slide, they give you exhaustive list of possible uh, compact complex surfaces, which are stationary under the fluid closed flow, which is nice. We would like to apply flow to get some classification. And we know if you if we hit something stationary, then these we can classify. So it's, it's, it's a really good start. So the, a little difficulty uh, starts when you we introduce a notion of solitons. So if you study any geometric flow, actually, uh, uh, and as any geometric flow, pluri closed flow is invariant under the action of diffeomorphism group uh, on M. So what might happen happen? We might encounter solitons. So solitons are stationary solutions, but not quite stationary. They're stationary modular diffeomorphisms and maybe scalings. So these are solutions uh, which are uh, pullbacks of some fixed metric under a family of diffeomorphisms, and then maybe a scale by, again, some scaling factor. And such behavior is possible even for Ricci flow. It was, again, observed already by Hamilton, and it was one of the big di difficulties, existence of such solitons, which was resolved in Perelman's work. So he basically, I just how to, to work with them and how to rule out some of them as, as appropriate singularity uh, models. So anyway, if we, if we want to understand pluri closed flow, we are essentially forced to understand solitons as well. So uh, to understand and classify solitons, uh, we need a little bit of more theory about uh, this pluri closed flow. It actually shows you uh, what is this extra structure and why this uh, flow is actually geometrically significant. So the crucial feature of this uh, pluri closed flow that it admits a gradient flow interpretation similarly to the Ricci flow. Specifically, if you have your manifold, so it's equipped, if it's equipped with the metric G and this three form H, and you also pick up any smooth function F, then uh, you can uh, cook up this number. This it's called uh, F functional for following the notation of Perelman for the Ricci flow. So it's some sort of uh, Hilbert Einstein function. So it's uh, integral of uh, scalar curvature, and it also includes norm of the torsion and norm of the gradient of F, uh, integrated again against this weighted volume form. So for every function F, you'll have an appropriate number, and then you could uh, find the infimum of those values among all uh, functions f for which the total uh, normalized volume is one. So this is again so-called uh, 
lambda. This lambda is actually the lowest eigenvalue of an appropriate uh, second order differential operator on M. So there's a second order differential operator on M, uh, on, on functions on M, and its lowest eigenvalue is exactly this number lambda. So what Streets and Tian proved, they extended the result from the Perelman's result from the Ricci flow. They proved that this quantity lambda is monotone under the pluricosed flow. And it is fixed precisely on uh, steady solitons. So if you have a soliton which uh, moves just by diffeomorphism, then uh, clearly this lambda does not change because lambda is invariant under the action of diffeomorphism group. So the result of Street and Tian, they tell us that uh, we actually necessarily satisfy a very restrictive set of equations. So the structure, which is a soliton, uh, satisfies this uh, system of equations. So that's what we would call uh, gradient steady solitons. So the manifold satisfying this equation is called gradient steady soliton. And it leaves us with a problem. So how do we construct uh, or classify steady solitons for pluricosed flow on compact or actually also interested in complete uh, surfaces? So maybe I'll start with discussion of uh, compact surfaces. So we, we proved in a joint work with, with Jeff Streets uh, that if you take hop surface, which we've seen before. But now you do not assume that alpha and beta have the same norm. So they can be arbitrary complex numbers as long as this is a contraction. So these are two complex numbers with uh, norm less than one. So it's still a complex surface. It's still diffeomorphic as three SS1 times S1. It's not biholomorphic to the hop surface, which I mentioned before. So as a complex surface, it's a new surface. So we prove that it admits unique steady soliton uh, with maximal uh, symmetry. This part we actually we proved in, in 19, but in a very recent, uh, in actually in an ongoing project, we, which we're just finishing with Jeff Streets and Vestislav Apostol, uh, we proved uniqueness without these assumptions. So you don't have to have this assumption of maximal symmetry. You actually can prove uniqueness of uh, great and steady soliton up to the action uh, of. Uh, well, actually, I have to correct myself. No, so for, for this specific result, yeah, we have to assume symmetry. So the result which I will start, I started describing, I will get to it later probably. So yeah, this result so far, we have it only on, under the assumption of this maximal S1 uh, cube symmetry, and would like obviously to have it uh, without this assumption. So we expect that we don't need that. So it's a good start. So we have uh, some examples of compact solitons and these are genuine solitons. So here, uh, this diffeomorphism, uh, the action of diffeomorphism group will be actually non-trivial uh, as opposed to, to the round hop surface. Specifically, it's, uh, it's manifest in the fact that this function f, which appears in the equation of solitons, here it is non-constant. So in general, when you try to apply uh, any geometric flow to the existence, uh, apply geometric flow and try to understand its long time existence and possibly convergence to some nice limiting objects, then often these limiting objects, they pick up extra geometric structure, which wasn't present initially. So for instance, if you take any metric on a two sphere, which might not have any symmetries and you run the flow, then in the limit, it will converge to the round matrix. So it will pick up a large symmetry group. So similar things happen for many other geometric flows. The, the extra structure, which I would like to discuss here is a so-called generalized scalar structure. And the reason why it's relevant is that many natural pluri closed structures, which we're looking for, they are parts of this richer generalized scalar structure, which fits nicely in the Hitchens uh, generalized geometry uh, uh, story. 
So let me give you a definition. Uh, pluricloud structure, again, I recall you that this is a complex uh, manifold, not necessarily surface even here. Uh, so G is a uh, permission metric, which is pluricloud. I is a complex structure. We will say that it's a part of generalized scalar structure, and generalized scalar structure consists of the following data. It's the same manifold, same metric, same complex structure, and an extra complex structure, second complex structure, which I will denote J. So such that uh, this uh, triple is also pluricloused, uh, and its torsion, torsion of this new complex structure is negative the torsion of the first one. It's not quite clear why you would study things like this, uh, but yeah, believe me, they really naturally appear from generalized geometry, which I don't have time to discuss here, unfortunately. And these equations, they actually were discovered a long time before in physics. Maybe I'll give you a couple examples. So there is a stupid example of hypercalar manifolds. Uh, so the hypercalar manifold is a manifold metric and a triple of complex structures which satisfy quaternionic relations and all of which are calar. So I, J, and K are all calar with respect to metric G. So you can actually pick up any pair of complex structures here and both of these terms, they just will vanish. So trivially, you will have a generalized scalar structure. There is a more interesting non calor example, which occurs and easiest to describe on the standard hub surface, which I introduced initially. So you can take a uh, hub surface, which I recall the quotient of C2 minus the origin by contraction. So a smooth manifold, it's uh, three sphere times a circle. And then what you can do, you can reflect three sphere uh, along the equator. So you can consider reflection of uh, S3, and you can also consider reflection of S1. Again, sort of take equator, which is S, S0, and you reflect the circle uh, along this equator. So if you take uh, consider the composition of these two reflections, you will have an evolution of S3 cross S1, which preserves orientation. And you can pull back uh, initial complex structure by this involution, which obviously will give you another complex structure on the same manifold. And this new complex structure will be the one which extends it to generalized scalar uh, manifold. So that's how you can get a non scalar example of generalized scalar manifolds. So, which shows you that generalized scalar structures are richer and their set is bigger than the set of just scalar structures. So somehow magically, if I take this evolution for metric G, which I have seen before, and I compose it with evolution equation for this complex structure, second complex structure G, basically by just pulling it back by time-dependent flow of diffeomorphisms, then this new flow not only preserves pluriclosed structure, we already knew it that this preserves pluriclosed and Hermitian structure for complex structure I, but it also preserves generalized scalar structure. So general scalar structures can also can be flown if you appropriately apply pluriclose flow to that. And this flow is called generalized scalar flow, and the solitons of this flow, they're uh, called generalized scalar solitons. And we conjecture that actually any soliton for pluriclosed flow actually picks up this uh, larger and like richer generalized scalar structure, generalized scalar soliton structure, at least locally, at least uh, all like on the level of universal cover, if you like. So that's at least what happens for all the examples which we know. Uh, we don't have proof for it, but yeah, that's that will be amazing to have this conjecture to have. It will be really a huge step to classifying solitons for pluriclosed flow. So maybe a couple of remarks, uh, again, relate, relate to this conjecture and related to our theory of this Jeff. So pluriclosed flow on hop surface, uh, which we constructed on our paper is actually part of regionalized scalar structure. So it kind of confirms this conjecture. 
what we also can prove that you have any generalized scalar soliton, uh, then this uh, soliton as a complex surface, uh, it's either Calabi-Yau, so it's a torus or K3 surface, or a finite quotient of, of a Hobbes surface. So uh, again, it gives you a complete classification of uh, possible generalized scalar solitons. Uh, and it's a good indication that uh, it could be used to get at least some information about classification of uh, complex surfaces. So this generalized scalar structure, again, I recall you that it's a manifold metric and two compatible complex structures. Uh, so they are pluriclosed, that, is, uh, that means that uh, torsion form is closed, and I and J, they have opposite tor torsions of opposite sign. So yes, I mentioned these were first discovered in physics of supersymmetry. There is a seminal work of Gates, Hall, and Rochek where they uh, appear for the first time. And again, they were extensively studied by Gualtieri as uh, appropriate formulation of uh, Hitchens generalized geometry and appropriate formulation of what Keller geometry is uh, in this interpretation. Maybe to show that these manifolds, they actually have quite rich geometry. Uh, one indication of that is that if you consider this tensor, basically commutator of i and j, and then you uh, lower index uh, using a metric, that you would, what you would get is a, so it's a bivector, and this bivector happens to be a Poisson uh, structure. So uh, it's, uh, it satisfies certain uh, certain extra conditions of being being a Poisson structure. Not only it's Poisson structure. Uh, if you cook up from it, uh, it it is in uh, it's a common real part of uh, I holomorphic and J holomorphic Poisson structures. So there are holomorphic Poisson structures for I. There is a holomorphic Poisson structure for I, and there is a holomorphic Poisson structure for J, and they have a common real part. So again, it shows you that this is a quite rigid structure, and in general philosophy here is a generalized scalar geometry. Uh, among other things, it also should allow you to study uh, Poisson, holomorphic Poisson geometry of Keller manifolds. So if you're not only interested about Keller manifolds, but also interested about their holomorphic Poisson structures, then that's uh, the, geomet the geometry which you want to study. And that's where uh, generalized scalar Ricci flow might be helpful. So now let's discuss about, uh, let let's discuss a bit uh, what we can say about generalized scalar solitons. So if you have a manifold, generalized scalar manifold, which is, uh, which gives you the solution to the soliton equation then you can actually deduce a lot of interesting things about uh, this structure. So first, uh, similarly to Keller situation, you will always have a vector field which is iholomorphic. And if you apply i to this vector field, this vector field will be killing. So maybe uh, a good example here, there is a Ricci soliton, Keller Ricci soliton on S2 with quantical singularities. So you have quantical singularities here. And this Ricci flow is a soliton. Uh, th th this structure is a soliton, Keller Ricci soliton structure in the soliton vector field. Basically, the generating the diffeomorphism group is a flow of, uh, uh, of this uh, radial field, which I have drawn on this picture. And this radial field, it of course preserves a uh, complex structure, which you have here. And I of that, if you apply complex structure, then you'll have a rotational vector field, which is just killing. So this vector field is killing. So that's a picture for the keller which is soliton on sphere with, with two quantical singularities. So something similar happens here. You have a vector field, which is uh, holomorphic, which preserves holomorphic structure. And I of that is killing. And actually you have two such vector fields, one for I, and one for J. And it leaves us with interesting dichotomies. So we have two killing vector fields. And what we 
immediately conclude that either these two vector fields are aligned with each other, basically proportional to each other, or isometric group of your manifold is at least two dimensional. So the case where uh, when an isometry group is at least two dimensional, this is an ongoing project and actually, which is quite interesting because it reduces to the study of uh, so sort of real ampere, real Monge ampere equation on domains in R2. So we are sort of far from settling it yet. So there are many open questions, but at least we have this reduction to Monge ampere equation, which is, I mean, always nice to have uh, relation to some well-studied PDEs. So uh, now, like the four things, I mean, this is something we, we are doing at the moment. And it seemed to us to be quite kind of restrictive, having at least two-dimensional isometry. By now, we understand that probably it's actually not that restrictive. Uh, and that's the general case. We thought that this is a general case, and we studied it first. So that's what I want to discuss now. So we focus on case one. So, so further, we assume that these two killing vector fields are aligned with each other. And I would add a couple of assumptions. Uh, they are not really essential, but they simplify the, the exposition. So we assume that these two vector fields are non-zero. Because if any of these vector fields is zero, that essentially means that your, your manifold is uh, Conformal Keller again, and that's completely another story. It's it's very special, and so on. so we assume that these two vector fields are non-zero, non and that this vector field generates S one action, or proper R action actually also will work for us, or proper R action, because otherwise, if it doesn't generate proper action. It actually means again that your isometry group is at least two dimensional and you're in this special case, which I don't want to discuss now. So here are standing assumptions. So I have this one vector field, which is aligned with the same vector field for J and it generates S1 action. So this one S1 action would preserve G, I and J. So it preserves the entire structure entire general vascular structure. And I also assume that this tensor is invertible, which is uh, the case on an open dense set uh, if I and J induce the same orientation. So that's, uh, that's our extra assumption here, that this, this tensor uh, commutator of I and J is invertible. So it's invertible not entirely on M, but on all points of M where I is not plus or minus J. And that's again the interesting case where this is a proper subset, and actually it will be a an proper analytic subset of M. So what it gives us, it gives us on this open dense part M zero, where I is not plus or minus J. Uh, it allows us to cook up three symplectic forms. So one symplectic form is the inverse of the Poisson tensor. So Poisson tensor is invertible uh, as long as I commuted of I and J is invertible. And we'll have another uh, symplectic forms, uh, omega i and omega j. So I have a triple of symplectic forms and action of a circle. So if you have seen it before, you will probably uh, recognize here a familiar setting of the so-called Gibbons Hawking and Zatz uh, for gravitational instantons, which uh, I would like to discuss briefly. Uh, so what is Gibbons Hawking and Zatz? So if you have a four-dimensional manifold, a metric, and a triple of Keller structures satisfying uh, quaternionic relations, and S1 action, which preserves this entire structure and generate the, generates, is generated by the vector field X, then outside of isolated points of this S1 action, of course, uh, you can show that the action will be free. So you have a free action of S1 and the vector field X preserves three symplectic forms. So the Keller forms of I, J, and K. So since it preserves three symplectic forms and since your manifold is simply connected uh, by, by Cartan's formula, if you hook in X in any of symplectic form, you will have uh, closed and therefore exact uh, one form. 
which allows you to find three smooth functions, which are called mu i, mu j, and mu k, giving you a map from M0 to R3. And this is so-called hyperkeller moment map. So this hyperkeller moment map is constant on the fibers of S1. So uh, really what you have, you have your manifold on which you have free S1 action. You can take its quotient. So it's just a principal S1 bundle. And this quotient is it's a three-dimensional manifold. It's uh, mapped to a three to R3 through an open map. So it's one three-dimensional manifold openly mapped to R3. So how can we recover this uh, vector bundle and ge its geometry? Well, you can prove that the curvature of this S1 bundle is given by a very special uh, two form. This uh, two form is star dv, where uh, star is taken here with respect to, mat to flat metric on R3. You just take Euclidean metric on R3 and take a Hodge dual with respect to this metric. And function V is norm of X to the power negative two. And it happens that this function is a harmonic function on, uh, well, here or on R3, it depends on how you interpret it. So for any hyperkeller manifold with S1 symmetry, you have this picture. You have an appropriate harmonic function and curvature of S1 bundle is recovered from this, this function V. So that's what you have for any uh, hyperkeller manifold. And crucially, this can be inverted. Uh, you can uh, consider open map of anything uh, to R3. You can take harmonic function. Uh, you can consider S1 bundle with this curvature. And on the S1 bundle, on the total space, you can hook up hyperkeller structure. So the question really here is, so which openly mapped uh, N3, three-dimensional three manifolds, uh, which openly are mapped to R3, which of them eventually gives give rise to complete hyperkeller manifolds? So as often, we are really interested not in compact manifolds here, but in complete. So this question was completely resolved by Roger Bilavsky in uh, 99. So uh, he proved that any simply connected and complete hyperkeller manifold with S1 action uh, is a metric completion of this Gibbons Hawking ansatz for a very like, special sort of logical choice of a harmonic function. So V is a constant plus so-called uh, multi-monopole uh, potential on R3. So this uh, summons the solutions, fundamental solutions to the Laplace equation. So they are harmonic outside of Xi. You add uh, many of them, finitely many of them uh, with appropriate normalization constants. So the normalization constants here are actually important. And this allows you to recover a compl any complete hyper simply connected hyperkeller uh, manifold with S1 action. So what is remarkable in general here, what I find uh, why this actually is so interesting story uh, is that given Hawking ansatz allows you to reduce a complicated nonlinear partial differential equation, which is a requirement that reaches zero to the simplest linear equation which you can imagine just to Laplace equation. So your equation is that function V is harmonic. Maybe let me draw a picture here. So uh, how exactly it works. So you take R3, so this is R3. you pick up a uh, final collection of points Xi. These are Xi. Uh, you take this uh, monopole, multi-monopole potential. So this potential of course solves equation number uh, Laplace V equals zero. Laplace with respect to flat metric on R3. Uh, you cook up this curvature form from it. So this will be close to form and uh, it uh, defines you as one bundle uh, over, over, R, over R3 with these punctures. So over generic point, there will be, there will be a circle 
over these points, there will be nothing. But the point of this picture is that you can actually can fill in it by gluing in an extra point over each point xi. So here will be exactly fixed points of uh, your S1 action. And this will give you a complete hyperkeller manifold. On top of that, and any complete simply connected hyperkeller manifold with S1 action can be cooked up by this procedure. So that's uh, that's the beauty of this of this result. So going back to general scalar silicon, as we have mentioned, uh, that. Uh, if you start with generalized scalar uh, Ricci soliton, we such that uh, I and J is generically invertible, then you will have vector fields uh, which are killing, and we assume that they're both non zero and aligned and generate, generate S1 action. And this gives you a, a picture similar to Gibbons Hawking ansatz. So the question is can we, uh, can we somehow adapt any ideas from that? And the result uh, of uh, Jeff Streets and myself is uh, yes, a procedure similar to Gibbons Hawking ansatz gives an exhaustive construction of complete generalized scalar structures solving the soliton equation. Well, I put star here because we had, still have some uh, technical assumptions. So it's exhaustive under this text, te technical assumptions. So how, how does the proof goes? Uh, what are similarities with Stevens talking on that and what are the difficulties? So similarities is that there, there is still a moment map to R3. So this moment map, it will not be defined on M0 as before will be defined on, on its cover again because even if m was simply connected after you have removed this locus from m it will not be simply connected anymore or might not be simply, simply connected so you cannot really uh, define moment coordinates as here so here we knew by topological reasons that this closed form must, must be exact we don't know it anymore in general scalar setting so we will have to take a cover. So now you also will not have this nice Euclidean metric on R3 as before. Instead, this Euclidean metric will have some explicitly described metric and this metric will depend on one scalar function and the scalar function is trace of i and j. So this is so-called uh, angle function in, in this context. Uh, again, it, it determines this metric, but again, this metric will not be flat. You still can consider this function the in inverse uh, square norm of uh, vector field X. It will not solve the Laplace equation, but it still will solve uh, a linear PDE, a second order linear PDE with the leading term uh, Laplace V and Laplace is taken with respect to this metric H. Soliton equations uh, in this case, uh, so that's where Soliton uh, assumption comes in. They actually prescribe uniquely what this angle function must be. So they prescribe this angle function and in particular as a byproduct, they prescribe this metric H. And these two functions, uh, angle function and this inverse norm of vector field X, together they allow you to recover the total space of S1 bundle M0 over its, its, its quotient. And in turn, they recover generalized scalar structure on, on M0, uh, which satisfies solid on equations. So, so far it seems that everything works well, uh, which is true, but there are, quite a lot of technical difficulties, which I maybe briefly mentioned. So uh, new difficulties, which appear here compared to uh, given spoking at that. So one I have already mentioned, this metric H, which appears here on R3, is never flat and actually always incomplete. So you have to uh, consider metric which is incomplete on R3, which is a big diff uh, difficulty uh, analytically. The moment map, again, that's something I mentioned. It's not defined on M or on M minus fixed points. It's really defined on, uh, on a Z cover of an uh, open dense subset. 
Another extra difficulty that this S1 action uh, on M, it if you remove even if you remove fixed points, it might have non-trivial stabilizers. So it will not be free. It will be what is called almost free, which would make this uh, quotient into an orbifold as opposed to manifold. And the principal difficulties, I would say these two, that uh, since we're interested in complete solutions, we have to, and we are looking for solutions to some uh, linear second order PD. Uh, it is really hard to relate the properties of this solution. It's domain uh, where it is defined or like it's maximal domain of existence. It's hard to relate it to the completeness properties of your manifold. And in the end of the day to classify possible uh, functions, to classify uh, possible functions V giving you complete solutions, uh, you will have to study Laplace equation uh, on orbifolds. Uh, which again, it's it's a technical difficulty, but this is something we're uh, we have to use extra ideas. So maybe I'll draw a picture here. So the picture will be sort of similar. Instead of our three, uh, really. So if you if you think about com completeness issue, what you will have, I will draw one of the two cases. It's maybe the more general case. So down here you'll have S two cross R. So this is your three-dimensional analog of uh, R3. And you will have, so this will be northern pole and southern pole. You'll have two one-dimensional curves here. And you also might, uh, you, and you'll have specific metric here. And this metric, uh, so how it works, you can actually have an uh, angle singularity here. So you might have angle singularities here. So angle two pi over k plus and two pi over k minus. So that's your structure downstairs. So instead of just nice and simple uh, flat R3, now you have something uh, more nasty. So you will have this orbifold S2, S2 is the orbifold singularities multiplied by R. And these orbifold singularities are uh, two pi of the angle, the size of the angle is two pi over K. And you ha will have a specific metric H, which depends on K plus and K minus. So now you pick up a final collection of points as before Xi in the smooth locus of this, uh, this three-dimensional manifold. So if, for instance, if there is no angle singularity, you're allowed to pick a point Xi on this red line. So now over this uh, structure, you will have, uh, okay, so you now take this uh, multi-monopole potential, again, which is some combination of Green's functions, of certain Green's functions. Uh, appropriately normalized. So again, so there are several uh, extra difficulties here, but the, the essence is the same as before. And for this multi monopole potential, you can cook up uh, two form, which will be a curvature form. So with this uh, curvature form on the complement of this points Xi, you will have S1 bundle. So over any, any other point, you will have just a circle. And over these points, you will have fixed points of your S1 action here uh, on the top, on the top space. So this is three-dimensional base. This is four-dimensional total space. And on the complement of uh, fixed points, it will be an orbifold S1 principal bundle. Now, what about this uh, red curve here and red curve, curve here? Why do I care about them? Well, because if you leave this, them, what you will actually have is so their pre images will be analytic curves on the total space. And these are precisely the analytic subsets where i equals j on one of them and i equals negative j on the other. So this is specifically the loss i where plus on tensor was not invertible or where uh, i plus j is not invertible. 
So that's a picture and I'm, that's exhaustive classification of such structures. So that's probably the, the amazing part here. That, uh, it's all encoded by uh, angle singularities and by the positions of your uh, points xi. Uh, and I mean, couple of constants again, which are your parameters. But other than that, it gives you exhaustive construction of such uh, uh, complete general scalar solitons. So yeah, I'm a bit over time. Maybe I'll just briefly wrap up. So what are ongoing projects and open problems we're trying to address? So one is to classify complete solitons with two-dimensional symmetry group. And again, as I mentioned, it uh, is related to completeness properties of certain manifolds expressed through solutions to uh, mon jumper equations on R2. Uh, we would like really to understand the behavior of fluid closed flow without generalized scalar assumption on other class seven surfaces. And maybe the most interesting of those is parabolic uh, in new surface. Uh, there is the conjecture which I mentioned that uh, any complete pluriclosed soliton uh, on the, in, the, in complex dimension two is actually in a uh, generalized scalar, at least locally. And we would like to have uniqueness for pluriclosed solitons on compact, uh, compact or complete, complete surfaces. Uh, so far we have some sort of uniqueness for generalized scalar so, uh, solitons in compact case. This is a joint, joint uh, work with uh, Apostle of streets, but for pluriclosed flow, we don't really have a uh, good understanding. And maybe specific uh, example, a specific question, par partial question uh, here, which will be very interesting. Uh, so we expect that there is no pluriclosed soliton on hop surfaces of class zero. So there is a special cases, class of contractions and uh, related hop surfaces for which we expect that there is no pluriclosed soliton, but it should be related to some stability questions, uh, concepts which we haven't identified yet. Uh, and well, yeah, just uh, kind of a real open question, what happens in higher dimensions? So we have, we have basically just started understanding it and we have very little partial progress and on toric manifolds, but nothing beyond that. So yes, yeah, sorry for going a bit over time. I will probably stop here uh, and uh, thanks for, uh, for your attention.